Welcome back to the Aussie Shed, ladies and gentlemen, for episode 14 in the teardown and rebuild of its 7x14 Chinese mini lathe series. You'll notice here we're all set up, got a couple of indicators out, and we're about to start hooking into this here headstock. She's firmly back mounted onto the lathe bed. Now before we start doing any disassembly work, I might just take a few measurements, just for a bit of a reference and for a bit of understanding of how these come set up from the factory. So I'll set up an indicator and we'll just start measuring whatever the hell we can. I'm set up on the outer edge of the chuck mounting flange here and I'll just give it a bit of a turn. And we've got just over two one hundredths of a millimetre run out in that position there. No idea why at this stage. I'm sure all this will become apparent later. I'll just drop the indicator down into this face down in here. All right, so with the indicator mounted uh, in this location with the tip of the indicator resting on this position down in here and we rotate the shaft, you can see we have a little bit more of an issue there. We have about 11 one hundredths of a millimeter, so just over one tenth of a millimeter at this point. Once again, what the cause of that is, I have absolutely no idea, but I have noted that uh, the highs and lows aren't in the same location as on this outer flange. I don't think it's a spot that's po possibly caused by the bearings. It seems to be more in the machining on this shaft. But I guess we'll see as things progress. So that's those two spots. Okay, let's move the indicator again. Now set up on the outer face of the chuck mounting flange here. It doesn't seem too bad. It looks like the indicator is dragging slightly and moving slightly off the zero mark. But whenever the, whenever I stop turning it, it's maintaining the zero position all the way around. Actually, there's one spot there. Oh no, that's pretty good. A little tiny bit of movement. I might change indicators just to see if I can um, correct the issue with the, I think it's pulling slightly on the indicator stand. It's a pretty crap stand I've got there. I think there's a little bit of flex in it, which as it pulls forward, it's doing that, as you can see, like it's slightly moving the needle back as it's pulling forward, like that, like so. So like I say, when it's when it's stopped, everything seems to be good. I'll change indicators and see if I can um, get rid of that error out of it. But so far that looks pretty good. I might just drop down onto this face as well, just for curiosity. Uh, while I've got this indicator set up, then I'll then I'll just I'll swap over to this indicator. I just think it might be a little bit better suited to this type of measurement. I'll drop down onto here for now, just see what we get there. This one obviously is coming up a little bit worse. We've got a variation of about five one hundredths of a millimetre at the worst point. But I think this face is pretty irrelevant. Really, it's just the, this is the flange that the chuck mounts onto, and then you've just got the edge of the register here. Uh, so I don't think any small run out on this face here is really going to affect anything. I'll just change indicators and I'll recheck those two spots. All right, I've got a different indicator on the face of the chuck mounting flange here. Once again, it seems to be pretty damn good. I don't really have a problem with that. Almost no movement in the indicator at all, which really mirrors what the uh, what the bigger Mitch Toyo dial indicator said. I'll drop it down onto this face and see if we get a similar uh, measurement to the first dial indicator. So this indicator is showing about uh, about six one hundredths on that face there. So fairly consistent with the other one. Either way, I don't think this face is really gonna pose any problems. I might see if I can check it for a bit of end float. I'll just pop a piece of aluminium bar stock in here. See if I can, oh, that's pretty good. Quite a lot of force being applied to that. Very little movement. Very little movement. That's not too bad. And you've got to remember, we are dealing with 
a brand new machine here that's basically never been run so everything everything should be tight as tight can be I'll just change indicators again okay we'll just see if we've got any axial play that's actually looking quite reasonable can't get the indicator to show any movement at all so that's fantastic last one I might do is I might just check see if I can check inside the taper for any run out just by dropping down on that front edge so the indicator's mounted on the inside of the taper here. We'll just give it a little bit of a turn and see what happens. That's not too bad. We've got about 0 0.01 hundredth of a millimetre movement on the indicator. But the surface on the inside of this taper is actually pretty shit. It's um, a little bit irregular. I'd, I'd Went over it with a bit of uh, with a bit of wet and dry to try and clean it up a bit. Not too bad, but yeah, I'm getting about a hundredth of a millimeter. I think I might throw the chuck back on and uh, take some measurements off the chuck. Bear with me. Chuck's back on. Give it a few taps just to uh, make sure she's all seated properly. Yep, she's good. All right, I'll set up an indicator. We've got a uh, run out of about three one hundredths of a millimetre. Uh, I haven't tried indexing the chuck to see if that'll improve it or make it worse. You know, three locations you can sit in with, uh, with the three bolt mounting flange. It's something I'll do when I'm setting it up. So yes, so we'll see how this pans out in other areas. At this location on the chuck, we're looking at about about two one hundredths in that position. We'll get something mounted in the jaws and see if we're getting any run out there. Okay, so I've got an end mill mounted in the chuck now. I'll just give him a little bit of a turn. See, we're getting about five one hundredths of a millimeter. Just put a little mark in that spot and then rotate it in the chuck. I'll turn it 180 and see if I get the same point again. So I've rotated the end mill 180 degrees in the chuck just to make sure it's not an issue with the end mill itself. And the high spot is now 180 mils off from the mark that I put on the end mill. So that indicates to me that the uh, problem is run out within the, the chuck itself or the jaws of the chuck. There seems to be quite a few issues with how this is set up. So that gives you a bit of an idea how the machine comes set up from the factory. You can see it's not great. As a matter of fact, it's pretty terrible really. I haven't done anything to this chuck. I've just removed it and remounted it. I did clean up the the mounting face a little bit there was just a bit of crap in there and it was quite dirty before i remount all this i will pull the chuck apart and clean it and inspect it because it feels absolutely terrible inside it's very crunchy it's got stop stop start points when you turn the key it binds in areas and it's oh, look at that there it's a hard bit boom and it's so gritty, so gritty. It just feels absolutely terrible. So I guarantee you when I pull this thing apart, it's going to be full of all sorts of crap. Probably hasn't been cleaned from when it was machined. There just seems to be all sorts of issues. What we'll do now, I'll get the chuck off. I'll remove the headstock and we'll start tearing it down. I have the headstock here on the bench and I've rotated my, um, my vice around and I've got a set of aluminium soft jaws in the uh, vice there just so I don't mark the flange here on the um, on the headstock 
the lock nut configuration on the end here and I only have one small C spanner. I thought I actually had two but I've only got one. So I'm just clamping it in there just so it doesn't turn so I can undo these lock nuts one at a time. these bits and pieces off that's a great bit of gear isn't it this plastic spacer oh well Ah, finally, like extracting a tooth. I guess all that paint in there isn't helping. I guess that's what you do. You just paint it and just smash it all together over the paint. See, there's all paint inside of here. It's all paint on the shafts. Beautiful. That's how you do it. You don't clean the paint off. You just smash it together. Very nice. This is just a plastic cover plate, lots of paint on it, so you can't really tell what it is, but yep, it's just a bit of plastic. ABS, there you go, the good stuff. <laughs> God, look at that paint. So I might just take her over to the press, push this shaft out. Alrighty, we'll just pop this apart. There we go, she's out. I'll just finish tapping the bearings out of the casing. They tap out really easily. I already got one, I'll just get this second one. That's simple folks. And there we have our bearings. So this is how it all stacks in. You got your main shaft, this front, I don't know what you'd call that, cover not a seal bearing casing bearing cover gear spacer gear lock nuts as you can see this is one of the simple headstocks there is no gearing in this headstock it's just the budget version that's just a straight drive uh, if you have one that has a low and high gear it'll be a little bit more complicated there is another gear down in the bottom but it's all pretty self-explanatory once you start to get it all apart. But uh, that's the breakdown of all of our parts and also the order, the order that they go back in. So we'll start looking at the parts and, uh, and see what the go with them is. As you can see already, there's, there's paint all over the shaft here, which is where the gears go on. It was a little bit, a little bit of a struggle getting the gears off due to this paint that's on there. Everything's got paint on it. They've obviously assembled it 
basically masked it and then just painted the crap out of it. I've cleaned this one up already just on the belt sander. It's They're not flat on the face, not flat on the bottom. I just gave it a little bit of a lick on the belt sander and deburred it because it all has very sharp edges. None of these holes um, are deburred at all. So basically I've just cleaned this one up. It honestly took me like a minute to deburr it, countersink the holes, countersink the edges of the holes properly, um, and just flatten it off on the belt sander. And at least now it's nice and flat. It's a pretty useless piece in my opinion. It doesn't fit tight around the shaft at the front, so basically crap can get in there anyway. And then you've got no way of getting it out while this is in there. So I'm half tempted to just leave it out. We'll, uh, we'll see. They just can't help themselves. Everything's just shit. So we'll start cleaning things up and we'll have a bit of a look. One thing I did notice quickly, I just handled the main drive gear before and it is sharp, mate. There are, the, no time's been spent on this thing. It has not been cleaned up. There are burrs everywhere, like you wouldn't believe. I don't know how that will affect the belt life, but once again, with all these bits and pieces, all you can do is just clean them up to the best of your ability and um, reassemble it and hope that everything's good. I hope the bearings will make a bit of a difference to the run out. Basically, I've got no idea. As I said, this, is, this unit is completely new. None of the flaws with this component is due to wear. It's just how it came from the factory. The machining on these surfaces is, is pretty crap. It's definitely not what you'd call a smooth job yet. Like, that's where it's been machined to take the bearings. Or, oh, yeah. And she's rough as, mate. It grabs your fingernail when you go across it. All these surfaces as well. I guess all we can do is just clean it all up a little bit and reassemble it and see how she comes out. Once it's mounted, I think we can probably recut this anyway to clean it up if it, uh, if it needs a little bit of attention. It's quite on the hideous side, but we'll, we'll get it back together and we'll have another look at it. This main shaft here, man, this end was sharp. It was razor sharp on the end here. I've cleaned all that up now. The threads were a little bit damaged in a in a couple of spots, but um, yeah, man, it was razor sharp on the end. Really, really sharp. Anyway, no big dramas with that, but you'll like this. Okay, the lock nuts. These are the lock nuts that hold the assembly together at the back there. All the gears and everything. I could actually get this on. So that's one of them. I'll just screw that down. Have a go at this next one. You watch this as it goes on. Look at the shape of this thing. It's been threaded way out of whack. Look at the gap there. Just the shape of this thing. Great to watch, isn't it? What a beautiful bit of gear that is. Mmm. Bloody hell, what a piece of crap, honestly. Who'd fucking... Who'd throw that on something? Like, this one's great. No dramas at all with that one. But Jesus Christ. What a piece of crap. I've just finished deep burring this, the main drive gear here. It's uh, it's come up pretty good, you know. They just need a bit of a clean up, but that's pretty good now. Something else I thought I'd show you. I was having a look at this. I haven't started cleaning this one up yet, and I thought, no, I won't clean this up. I'll I'll put it on camera, and that way people could get a bit of a look at it. Someone's. You can see the deburring job that's been done on this. Someone's just randomly, I'd say it was cut from this side and it blew out on this side over here. It looks like it's been deburred with a brick. But it is like really rough. Really coarse, whatever they use to deburr it. And just 
fucking all over the joint. It's just atrocious. So, still got to clean that up. But I thought, no, nah, there's some lols in that. Definitely some lols in that. I'll put that on camera. Beautiful. Finished both these plastic covers now. At least they're flat. Quite easy to just put them on the belt sander and flatten them off. They were very lumpy bumpy. Even when they were screwed down, they wouldn't have sat flat against the surface. But not that they're really anything anyway. They're just a piece of junk anyway. But clean them up. It doesn't take any time. This is the old bearing here on the right. And this is one of the new angular contact bearings on the left. You can see this one's blue on the back. It almost looks the same, except that's paint. But uh, yeah, they're exactly the same. They're exactly the same width. Uh, same size everywhere. So they go straight on. Unfortunately, unlike the tapered roller bearing sets that you can get for the mini lathe, um, the closest taper roller bearing is 1.5 millimeters wider. So you just end up with a bit of an increase in the overall size of that stack once it's put together. Uh, I don't think that would be necessarily a problem. Uh, the only issue with the tapered roller bearings is they're an open bearing and it's pretty much impossible to get um, grease or oil into them once the, um, once the assembly is, is put back together. Uh, how long the original greasing will last before it'll need redoing, no idea, but for me... Angular contact bearings, they're sealed. They perform the same sort of task as a tapered roller bearing. Uh, they should um, they should do the job nicely. I'll put the part numbers in the description anyway. Not sure if you can read it there. I don't think I can even read it without my glasses. I won't read it out to you because I'll likely bugger it up and give you the wrong number. Anyhow, that's, these guys are ready to go. Headstock's now painted. The angular contact bearings are in. I didn't video pressing these on. It's uh, not really a lot of excitement there. The only thing that you really need to take note of with angular contact bearings is that the bearings need to be pressed on opposing each other. Ain't the angular contact bearings. They only work in one way, much like a tapered roller bearing does. So they need to oppose each other in exactly the same way, uh, just so that they uh, lock the shaft in both directions and that's not just blue paint that's actually the contact angular contact bearing so i did end up putting the cover back on on the front over the bearing i've just got to set about assembling all the back end of it now first thing that goes on now is the uh the other plastic cover plate minus paint of course Okay, so the, uh, the main belt drive gear, I'll tell you what, goes on and off a bit easier without all the paint. I'll just clean this up a little bit. Bear with me for a second. Mm. Even the key goes in better without paint. What's going on? That's a scary fit, isn't it? Look at that. It's, it's been cut out for the keyway, but it can just freely rotate around uh, where the keyway is. It's just so oversized. What a piece of crap. Definitely not the best made bit of gear, is it? My God.
as I mentioned when I pulled it apart, I don't have two of these small C spanners. So I've just put a couple of bolts through the chuck. Got a piece of 25 by 25, I think it is, or 20 by 20. Just sat that on the bench. Turn the chuck around. That locks it up. Put the C spanner on and crank it home. That's all there is to that. That'll be um, plenty tight enough. As long as the crappy lock nut holds on, which I'm sure it will. And she's all ready to take us home for now. Starting to look pretty bloody good, ladies and gentlemen. I'm starting to get excited. I'm feeling a bit of big Kev coming over me. Big Kev's a bit of an Aussie thing, you won't understand it if you're from overseas, but believe me, Big Kev, he used to get excited. And that's how I feel right now. The bolts are all in here now to hold the uh, the headstock onto the lathe bed. As you can see, there's a bit of, bit of slop on these holes, like everything on this thing. They, uh, it's probably two mil. So if you've got a bit of a, if you've got any sort of an issue with your um, with your gears and everything not not lining up, you do have a little bit of room, I guess, to play with. I'm not sure whether that's ever an issue for anyone. I guess really you'd want the thing pushed right back as a starting position for it. I'll leave it there and I'll just do them up anyway. It's probably going to have to come off at some point. I doubt it's there permanently, but uh, I'll just nip them up and it's bloody good. So she's firmly affixed in position again, all rebuilt and ready to go. I, uh, I guess I might take some more measurements on it. One thing I did notice, I forgot to set the dial indicator up on the register for the chuck. And just looking at it, it's pretty rough, eh? It could be uh, the cause of, well it, it probably is the cause of the run out on the uh, on the outside of the chuck when it was mounted on there but I'll set the dial indicator back up and um, we'll recheck this and see what it looks like now not that I really expect too much to have changed but I guess we'll see well so far getting a, quite an improvement on this one The, uh, the, uh, the indicator is moving slightly when I, when I turn it, once again, because my stands are really shit and it's dragging the indicator a little bit, I reckon dragging it slightly forward, but it always returns back to zero wherever I stop it, which it certainly wasn't doing before. I'll drop that down onto that register there and I'll check that. It's, uh, it's showing pretty good on the register here, except when we hit that divot there, of course. But other than that, I'm not really getting any movement at all. I've got a funny feeling either this indicator is broken or things seem to have improved. Hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. I might just swap over to the other indicator now, just for a bit of a double checking reference thingamajig. Before I change the indicators over, I've just sat it on the, uh, I've just sat it inside the, the taper in the front, and all by one little spot, it looks pretty good. Like I say, the taper's not real clean anyway. It might be able to be cleaned up. There's not a lot in there now. All right. I'll swap indicators over and we'll have a bit of a look. Right, with this indicator on, we're getting one hundredth of a millimetre on this. And it's in the same spots. I've still got the lows and highs marked on this from, um, from when it was in here originally. And the high is still in the same spot. And the low is still in the same spot, which 
I assume means that's probably in the machining on the shaft. Um, but I'm not sure if that's an improvement on what we had before. I think it might be a little bit. I guess we'll see. I'm sure this in here will still be the same. I'm not even going to bother with that because it doesn't really, it's not really referenced or anything. But I'll drop down onto the register with this indicator and see what it's going to tell me. Yeah, I'm really struggling to get a good read with this indicator going on there. It's not good for this spot. It's very rough, this register for the chuck too. Like I can feel lumps in it with my nail. It's something that, I'll, that um, I think once I get the lathe running, I'll be able to clean that up a bit. It's very, very hard to get the chuck on as well. It's very, very tight, so it could do with just a frag taken off it, which I'm hoping will clean it right up and um, make a little bit of a difference. Either way, I might just throw the chuck back on, just for curiosity's sake. And there we go, with the chuck just banged on in just a random spot. Like I say, no indexing's been done with it yet. I just Honestly, couldn't be bothered because this chuck's going to be coming on and off a few times and maybe permanently off. I don't know yet. I might, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But in that position there, we've got about uh, six one hundredths, maybe a little bit, maybe seven one hundredths. Probably dropping back a little bit behind the zero in the low spot. Yeah. Uh, just over six one hundredths. Like I say, the the register on this shaft is is pretty crap. I think that could be causing most of these problems. So I might leave this video there for the time being. There's no point going any further with this until this register for the chuck gets cleaned up. I can't do that until I get the lathe running. The main purpose of this was to have a bit of a look at everything and to repaint this housing in something a bit more suitable as I've done with all the rest of the components on the lathe. As you saw there was nothing really wrong with the bearings that uh, that came with it at, that, at this point being that they're brand new and they haven't uh, sustained any wear. For the long term I think the angular contact bearings will turn out to be a much better choice. At least I'm aware of everything to do with this particular component. And part of the process of me doing this has been to familiarise myself with all the components that uh, make up this mini lathe. And obviously to make any corrections to stuff as I can possibly do along the way. So that's that's pretty good now I think. There's not much more that I can achieve uh, with the headstock unit other than cleaning up the mounting face for this chuck. The chuck itself is a whole other issue. I'll be doing a separate video on the teardown of this chuck. So keep an eye out for that one. Uh, but for now yeah I, th I think that'll do this video. If you're still watching at this point, thanks for hanging in there through the whole thing. A lot of time these teardowns can be a little bit on the monotonous side. All I can say is you must be a glutton for punishment. As always, thanks for stopping by the Aussie Shed. I really appreciate having you here with me. Remember to like and subscribe. It really helps me out on YouTube. And if you feel so inclined, you can help support the Aussie Shed by donating at PayPal or Patreon. Links in the description. But for now, cheers.